Uh, and now I just want to do a little bit of an update. Apologies to all my MOs because we've had a lot of dilly discussions in the last um, in the last two three months. Um, but I'm just going to you know touch on sort of the key diagnosis and management of drug induced liver injury. So the HIV Clinician Society has recently brought out a very nice guideline to just help um, update the 2013 guideline that came out 10 years ago now. Um, and it's a little bit more also contextual in terms of um, our current ARV regimens, et cetera. So just a reminder, obviously we don't do routine leave to routine um, LFTs, but if you've got a patient who comes in on TB treatment, obviously if they've got jaundice and they're nauseous, we know that we need to do our LFTs, but also if a patient's got a new rash. So if you see a patient at the two week visit and they've got a rash on their TB treatment, please also do an LFT and an INR because sometimes that is actually a nevirapine hypersensitivity in the old days, for example, um, or part of hypersensitivity syndrome can also affect the, the, the liver as well as the skin. So what we do is, is when somebody comes in um, and they are jaundiced and they've got potential and you've done your LFTs and there's abnormal LFTs, we make a presumptive diagnosis just based on that LFT. So somebody comes in, they're on TB treatment, now they're jaundiced, the LFTs are abnormal, We'll look at the criteria in a moment. Obviously, you want to first exclude other things that it might be, because it might be hepatitis B, right? It might be TB iris. Um, but you're going to make an assumption that it might be DILI until you have all your results back and start treating them as a DILI. That's very important. So the criteria has shifted slightly. Um, and to be able to diagnose drug-induced liver injury, you look at your ALT. Your ALT is the be-all and end-all, okay? Not the AST. Ignore the AST. Ignore the ALP and gamma GT. You want to look just at the ALT to make your diagnosis. So the first criteria is an ALT more than three times the upper limit of normal. As far as I know here in our department, the upper limit of normals we get back is 35. So that means an ALT of over 105. And the patient has symptoms, so they're unwell, or the, or the, the total bilirubin is over 40. So in the old days, the bilirubin used to be a separate criteria, but it's now added into patients where the ALT is over three. Usually, if your bilirubin is over 40, you'll be symptomatic. It's bilirubin that makes people so nauseous. If the ALT is over five times the upper limit of normal, so that's 35 times five, I think it's 175 or something. Um, even if they're asymptomatic, we would call that a dilly. Um, and then you might have some patients where they've already had liver problems before you started them on TB treatment. And then sometimes using this, you know, they already had an ALT over 100, even when you started them on the TB treatment. And then you're going to use ALT more than twice the baseline as your, as your reference point. So that's your main three criteria. So then make your final diagnosis. You're going to exclude either all your other causes, take proper history and make sure there's no other medicines that might be part of the problem. Very important to check for your hepatitis, depending on your area. Um, and you don't need to check for the weird and wonderful um, um, at this point. In child childbearing women, you want to know if they are pregnant. We don't do ultrasounds for dillies. So if you are confused about another diagnosis because of very high ALP and gamma GT, by all means, but we will not do that for somebody who's simply got um, a higher ALT. And so when you've excluded all of that, you can then say, no, my final diagnosis is I've excluded the other causes, met the criteria, this patient does have anti-TB treatment dilly. Please remember irises. The irises can be confusing, but your TB irises usually will have more of a tender hepatomegaly and very important is usually the ALP and the gamma GT that's going to go up because your TB is literally either pressing on the liver or actually making a granulomas that's infiltrating into the liver. And these patients often don't necessarily have jaundice and the ALT is usually under that three times upper limit of normal. We can only diagnose TB iris with a liver through a liver biopsy. So actually you have to make a clinical decision on whether you think. If there's a mixed picture, so sometimes you get the LFT and everything is up. It, to make it really simple from a DILI point of view, it usually means that the patient probably has extra pulmonary TB as well as a DILI. You're still gonna use your DILI criteria to decide what you're going to do with treatment. So we're gonna decide how severe our patient is because that's also gonna help us decide whether we need to admit. So anybody who is asymptomatic um, with an INR of under five, we call that mild. If they do have symptoms, but that INR is still under a 1.5, we would call that moderate. 
um, and severe as anybody who's got an INR of over 1.5. And we will not manage those in our settings. Even in a district hospital, I would send those patients up to a higher center of care. Most patients with ADELI should be admitted. Definitely those that um, have moderate, you would definitely want to admit those. The mild ones one can consider doing as an outpatient, but only if you're sure they're going to come back for their weekly blood test and their weekly monitoring. If they're going to struggle to get to the hospital, even if they're really well, you're going to have to admit them and sort them out in your hospital setting. So we're going to very just quickly go through the steps. There um, are more detailed presentations on Delhi um, on our website. So firstly, review your diagnosis. Um, so this is just referring, and they always have this in the guide. Now you see a patient that have been two months on TB treatment. Now they've got a Delhi. Just double check, do they actually need to be on the TB treatment? In our scenario, it's really difficult to make that call because quite often you haven't seen the patient. So it's sometimes difficult to now know what was the reason. So it's easy if you've got bacteriological confirmation, but if you don't have bacteriological confirmation, I find it very difficult at this point to decide, no, I don't think the patient had TB in the first place. Step two is now to review the medication. So the problem with Delhi is, is there's very many medicines that can cause the Delhi, at least um, either PZA, rifampicin, or INH might be the problem from your TB drugs, and you can't tell which one. And if you continue with the wrong one, it's got a very high mortality. So we don't guess. So as soon as you know there's a Delhi, you're going to stop all those TB medications as well as the Bactrim. In terms of our ARVs, if they're on ARVs less than six months, even with a TLD, we would consider also stopping the ARVs. Um, um, but if they're on a dolitegavir based regimen, which they will all be these days, we're not really using efavirenz. If they've been on treatment for longer six months, now you start TB treatment, now they've got a deli, it's probably not the ARVs. Um, and dolitegavir is very uncommon in terms of causing delis, so we will just continue um, our ARVs. You should not be seeing patients on lipinavir, ritonavir, or efavirenz, but if you do, they're going to go to, on to um, dolitegavir. Um, and then just a, a little note, Patients on darinavir, ritonavir, and atazanavir, ritonavir. These are going to be more and more our third-line patients that we might see on these regimens. And just remember that you cannot give these with rifampicin. Um, so in patients like that, you definitely want to, um, they should be on, usually we use rifabutin when we re-challenge them. And that's just a little side note. The other issue is patients on fluconazole for cryptococcal meningitis. So if the CD4 is over 200, um, they're on maintenance dose. Even if they haven't done the whole year yet, you can risk interrupting your fluconazole. But if the CD4 is under 200, or if they're obviously on the intensive consolidation phase, we're going to discuss with an ID, and we're going to probably try and keep that fluconazole going. Otherwise, you're going to have problems, one thing on top of the other. And just make sure you're not sure that not taking anything else that can also cause trouble. So an important thing in the new guidelines, which is very, very helpful, is what we call background or holding regimens. Um, and generally, this is what we do is we stop the TB treatment and do we give them something to just at least manage the TB while we're waiting for the ALT to drop. So in the intensive phase, we like to use holding regimens because we're still treating this very actively replicating TB. Generally, in a continuation phase, we would just interrupt treatment. And you don't worry about holding regimens once they're in the continuation phase. So this is the new recommended regimen for our holding regimens. In the old days, we used to use injectables. Please, we no longer use injectables in any context. Um, very high risk of ototoxicity and renal toxicity. Um, and we now have linezolid, amazing drug, very much available. As I've mentioned earlier, the only problem with linezolid is anemia. So if anemia is an issue, well, it might be in your TB patient, we can also use clofazamine or terizodone. Um, instead of the linezolid, and you can see there's the different dosing for those because you're going to have to look up the individual dosing and you're going to have to work out that holding regimen for your patient. So now in terms of monitoring, you're going to do that ALT two or three times a week, which works quite nicely if you're in the ward um, and you want, to, you want to get that ALT under, under um, 100. And it takes about a week, which is not too bad. And sometimes it can take two weeks. The thing that took really, really wrong used to be the bilirubin, but they're less, more relaxed now. The bilirubin mm. doesn't have to be normal. It just has to be on a downward trend. Once the ALT is under 100, we can actually now re-challenge um, our patients. And important to realize that 20 or 90% of patients, actually you know, more closer to 90 than 20, um, usually can be re-challenged re very safely. 
Um, but when we do recurrences, it's it's most commonly with PZA. So there's generally a tendency, if you don't really need the PZA, then let's not bother with the PZA. If your patient's really sick, um, like with the TBM or extra pulmonary TB, you might want to go hold on. I think it's worthwhile just to see if we can get the PZA on, on board. So mild and moderate um, patients, and we're going to start off re-challenging them first with the INH and then the rifampicin. And as I say, we'll only re-challenge PZA in patients with TBM or if you can't use one of the other drugs. So these are the steps. Very easily, easily you start day one on INH. Um, and so your patient is still um, on that holding regimen, really, remember? And so if they're on linezolid, you're going to stop the linezolid and you're going to put them on the INH. So now the patient is on ethambutol, levofloxacin, and INH. Day three, you're going to check the ALT. If the ALT is obviously up, you're going to stop your INH. But if the ALT is okay on day four, then you're going to add your rifampicin, 600 milligrams a day. So now the patient is in refiner, ethambutol, and levofloxacin. Now on day seven, you'll check your ALT. If the ALT is up, you're obviously going to stop your rifampicin. If it's not up, now you can decide, am I going to add in my PZA? If you're not going to add in your PZA, then at this point, the patient is now on rifampicin, INH, and ethambutol, so you can stop your liver flux, and I'll show you the new regimens in a, in a, in a moment. Or if you're going to re-challenge with PZA, then the patient's actually now going to be on, on RIFA4. Um, and then if you did challenge the PZA, then on day 10, you're going to check that your ALT is still okay on the PZA. Very simple, straightforward. Um, I've also posted on the intern group, and I'll, I'll post in the... Um, in the notes section as well, we have a, a Dilly um, handout that summarizes all of these steps. Um, and then once you've actually re-challenged, you're going to check that ALT every week for a week after re-challenge. So this is what the new regimens look like. This is actually a change. We've had to change some of our patients that we actually were, were managing. The biggest change is the, the, the top line there. So patients who are already on where we stop the PZA. Um, so these are patients on RIF, INH, and ethambutol. And what we used to do is we used to give the RIF, INH, and ethambutol for a whole nine months. They've actually now changed that. You only need to give the RIF, INH, and ethambutol for two months. And then you're going to give RIF and INH for seven months. And that's probably already overkill. Um, of course, in TBM, um, you're going to give RIF, INH, ethambutol, and levofloxacin for 12 months. This is the recommended regimen if you can't use BZA. If you can't use INH, then you're going to use um, rifampicin, INH, BZA, and levofloxacin for six to some nine months, um, and similar regimen in TBM. And then um, uh, if, you cannot, if you can't use rifampicin, then we'll use the bpal owl in our current setting or whatever the, the RRTB guidelines recommend. Um, and then, of course, if you have lost more than one drug, then an ID specialist is going to have to help you figure out what to do. This is just a last slide overall in terms of TB. Um, we're at the end now, um, and there's always a question in terms of when we can use steroids in patients with TB. So this is particularly the, question, the concern with TB and HIV, but even in patients in TB on their own, because you need an immune system to really get rid of these infections. And steroids actually incapacitate your own body's ability to fight the infection. And there's been a risk with HIV patients, especially with advanced disease, for example, with a higher incidence of things like Kaposi sarcoma. So um, TB pericarditis is the only one where the risk definitely outweighs the benefit. Um, so the risk is of Kaposi's. Um, no, sorry. Oh, I've got this the wrong way around. The risk outweighs the benefit. So we would not use it in TB pericarditis. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't use it routinely in TB meningitis because the research is not inconclusive at the moment. It will depend on the patient's scenario, but it's just in TB in children where it might still be an option depending on, again, on recommendations from your pediatrician. Need to fix this for the presentation. Thank you very much. That's been a, a grand tour through the whole world of TB. Um, and it's still not even covered all the little bits that are out there. Um, and hopefully we'll get a brand new guideline soon. Thanks very much, everybody.